I'm Vic Vasquez, and I flew the third and did three combat tours to Southeast Asia. On 6 November 1966, I was flying in a two-ship Iron Hand mission. We were searching for three new suspected SAM sites above the DMZ. While searching for these targets, I started having engine problems, which I thought I could save the aircraft and nurse it back home. The further we got into the flight, the more serious my situation got, where I was no longer able to maintain airspeed or altitude, and I informed Clipper One that I was having to eject. The seat did a huge somersault where I could see my feet above the blue sky and came back around. The parachute ride down was very serene, peaceful, uh, very quiet. Looked down and saw I was going to land in very dense jungle, so I prepared for that. Once on the ground, I established contact with Clipper Lead, who informed me that search and rescue assets were on their way, and he instructed me to go off the air and save the battery. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Sound to your ears. This is Victor's take it. Can I get an app? My name is Bob Cooper. Late in the afternoon, we were launched on my birthday. We heard from Red Crown that a 105 pilot had punched out due to compressor failure, I think. That's all we knew. My boss on Halsey, Captain LeBourgeois, said, hold in that position, because I was just off the coast. Red Crown then said that no, the Air Force couldn't get there before sundown, send that poor little H-2 in after him. So in we went. So I went to look for a place to hide meanwhile and found a cave in which I entered. This is the first time I thought of the family. Uh, my boys were only six and five at the time. I was sure that if I did not get rescued, they would at least still be able to remember me. But I was concerned. I had a daughter that was less than a year old, and she would never know me if I didn't get rescued. So I said a little prayer. And as I finished my prayer, I heard the aircraft returning into the area. I went back out from the cave and made contact, and it was the Sandy rescue that was trying to make contact with me. Uh, I had to give it to those guys. Uh, they have big brass ones. While I was in the cave, the weather conditions had changed abruptly from where and I bailed out. And now we had a huge overcast with one sucker hole. And here Sandy lead, tell his wingman, he says, I think I can spiral down through that hole and get beneath the stuff. And here I'm looking at these coarse mountains. The tops of them disappeared into the clouds. That took guts for him to do that. He flew directly over me, and I got all excited, and I informed him he had just flown over me. He did not acknowledge or rock his wings or anything. Later on, in reading the transcripts from the command post of this rescue, I found out that he actually did hear me, but he is smart and he was playing the game, making sure he didn't want to give my location away in case there were bad guys around the area. You, you could see in the distance where the, the coastal plain started to rise. At about 2,000 feet, the cloud deck started, and it was solid. So we climbed up to about 8,000, I think. It usually went in pretty high anyway. Keeps you out of the ground fire, out of small arms fire, because they love to shoot at people. Anyway, we got above it. We joined up with those two Sandys. One of them had managed to get below the clouds, which was amazing. And he was, must have been having some difficulty maneuvering in those valleys because all the peaks were shrouded in clouds. He said, there's a hole I'm coming up. Sure enough, there was a hole there. I could see all the way to the jungle canopy, couldn't see the ground. He came up, I went down. Got under the clouds in a valley, running north and south. 
nothing was in it. I so disappointed I couldn't stand it by then. We searched up and down there. The Sandys were talking to Vic. I couldn't hear Vic. I could hear them. One of them said, I think I'm on top of you right now. I switched my radio to ADF and got a lock on him. I went to the east over a low ridge. As soon as I crossed that, I saw a hazy red smoke. Aha, the right valley, at last. Uh, we went up and down that, uh, that side of the valley for quite a while, but then we came across the wreckage. And shortly after that, we saw the chute. Then I got to talking to him. He said he's about, I don't know, 100, 200 yards, one way or the other of the chute, north, I think. So we slowed down and he talked us right over the top. Never did see him, ever. These guys were good. I couldn't believe it. When they dropped the tree penetrator through the trees, I only had to take one step to reach it. I folded out the blades, jumped on it. Now the only thing left to do was to secure the safety line around, and I couldn't uh, hook it up. Uh, anyway, we sent the penetrator down and waited and waited <laughs> and waited, and I was running out of fuel, and I said, come on. Uh, Finally, I switched the loud hailer, and I think he heard me. He said, you gotta get on that seat, cause I'm running out of gas. Next thing I hear through this megaphone is, hurry up, let us know when we can pull you up. We're low on fuel. That made me even more nervous, and I tried harder without any success. So finally, out of desperation, I didn't want him leaving without me. So I finally, out of desperation, and the radio said, now, I was going to say, OK, I'm ready. As soon as they heard OK, they jerked me up, which made me lose the grip on my radio. I lost it, dropped it in there. But the good news is now I at least had two hands to hold on to the cable. And shortly after that, the crewman that was running the hoist, Meyer, I think his name was, said, I think I got it. And sure enough, he started reeling the cable. And we were really in a high hover, about 180 feet. That's, that's big time. And I, sh shortly after that, he said, we do, we do, we have him, we have him. And I looked down there, hugging that post, baby. And I took off, I started climbing. We didn't get the guy till we were mid in the middle of the clouds. I had to get out of there. They pulled me up uh, through the trees. Uh, they had to use my shoulder as a battering ram to get th through this one branch. But finally, uh, I felt somebody grab the snap of my collar and pulled me into this chopper as it tilted down and it sped away. Uh, I checked my tech and I knew Da Nang was impossible. I could not get near Da Nang. The Kham Phanam was also too far away. And that's where I'd always intended to go if we managed to get out. But it was too far away. One of the Sandys just gave me a head bearing and, and distance to Halsey, and be darn, it was about 50 miles away. I'm Curtis Venable. I was the uh, senior uh, rescue crewman on the helicopter combat support squadron one. Captain uh, LeBorgio called me to the bridge, and he told me uh, he wanted to know what the, uh, the, uh, the fuel load was for my helicopter, and I told him. And then I found out where the helicopter was at, and I decided at that point that they weren't getting back. So that's what I told him. And he was full blessed. They were four boilers online. And we run about 45 minutes downstream. And I later was told that uh, we were doing 42 knots. Captain LeBourgeois, God bless him. He, he turned that ship south flank speed all the way down that coast. And he was right off the coast, about 20 miles by the time we got there. But that's where I went. I wasn't sure I was going to get there, but I knew if I could get to the water, we, could, we had a good chance to get picked up. 
I couldn't go down in North Vietnam. Uh, that never crossed my or Laos for that matter. That wasn't a whole lot better. That's where I went. Go to the water. Yeah, maybe. What else can you do? God ahead for the water. Uh, and that's what we did. In the chopper, it was so noisy, we could not talk to each other, but this young looking gunner kept on looking at, her, at me and kept on giving me the old thumbs up sign and not acknowledged back. So I was feeling really good that everything was fine. Pretty soon, he hands me a May West to put on. I think I'm heading west towards Nakhon Phanam where the rescue, Air Force rescue units came from. So I need a life vest just across the Mekong River. But then he opens up the door and starts dumping things out. The machine gun, all the ammo cans. And I'm thinking to myself, what the heck's going on? And then I remember the dramatic call, hurry up, let us know when we can pull you up. We're low on fuel. Started a slow, a low power descent just to keep some fuel in the tank. And uh, we managed to get to the water. A friend of mine was flying an H3 off the coast. Apparently someone had stationed him there. I don't know which carrier he was from, but uh, I knew we were home free at that point, even if I had to go in water. But the thing kept flying. Not a hiccup. I couldn't believe. The H2 has a two hour fuel, uh, endurance capacity. I was two and a half hours at that point. And I said, keep going as long as it'll fly. And sure enough, by golly, I got to, to Halsey, put it down, and the picture was taken. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And uh, when the helicopter landed aboard, I did the refueling myself, and uh, we had uh, about five gallons of Yuba fuel on board. We almost lost it. And there's like an iconic photograph of me with big bug eyes, and everybody that sees it says, man, you must have been scared. I really wasn't. I was shocked. I was shocked to find out I was on a ship. And of course, the joke in the family is that this was the most expensive Navy rescue ever and that I had to give him my first and second born because both sons went into Navy air. And see the entire film now streaming on Amazon and Tubi TV. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and comment below so as not to miss new upcoming videos. Thanks for watching. <laughs>